Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. I'm talking today with my good friend Frankie Tees, who runs the Frankie Files podcast. So, welcome to Mindshift Podcast, Frankie. Oh, thanks for calling me your friend. That's the honor. <laughs> yeah, we were on. Uh, we talked. What was it? A few months ago, I was on your show. Really good conversation. Although we, I guess we had some technical issues, didn't we? But it ended up coming out okay in the end. I really enjoyed that chat we had, and it was a, it was an interesting sort of the way you edited the podcast. I was like, "Where's Frankie in this thing?" It's me talking quite a bit, but then toward the end, you start coming in. So I, I, I think I messaged you, didn't I say, is there something wrong? Or no, you said, that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm, I'm trying some stuff. Yeah, that was really interesting because you could see I was answering the questions you were asking. You know, we were talking about my backstory and coming out of fundamentalist Christianity and all that good stuff. My work with, the, you know, Dominion theology and all the rest of it. So, yeah, we covered a lot of ground, didn't we? Yes, and people need to go listen to that. It's true, yep. So, Frankie, you came out of, I guess it was a new age cult. Maybe we should start with your backstory. Were you born into this cult, or did you join it at some point later in life? We were about age eight. I have a twin sister, and my mom went single parent, and she basically answered uh, like a flyer or something mm -hmm. in North Long Beach there in California. It was called uh, Parents Without Partner. Let's go have some pizza. Fill in the blanks on pizza gate that. It's really strange to go back and look at this stuff now. But, um, yeah, we went and had some free pizza, and everyone got reading from these psychic women who stood up there in white looking angelic. And, like, tarot readings, astrology readings, telling you your future, telling you about the spiritual science mm -hmm. is what they call them. And it was, like, you know, a thing during that time because we're talking circa, see, 1974. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say what what time period are we talking? So you're about eight years old. This is early 1970s. It sounds to me like it's got some overlap to Scientology, Dianetics type stuff, like a science of mental health type thing. Very much so. And that whole California area, mm -hmm. you know, Hollywood trends were going in and out of that, and Scientology, and then Deidre Place later, the rehab place, mm -hmm. with an S as well. I can't think of it. S E S T. Well, that too. Yeah, and you had a lot of like new age cults and stuff operating in that sort of early seventies. Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Yogananda and other beliefs, definitely Eastern beliefs. And the most person I've heard speak about this is Doctor John Yanya. Well, who yeah, speaks yeah. To the new age in some precision with great precision. You know, like the origins are from the Book of Urantia, the concept of the age of Aquarius. And that's the kind of stuff we were greeted with. So to take you back to my story, which at Pizzagate party. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure it was Pizzagate. <laughs> it's tripping me out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Too many parallels. Too many. And <laughs> um, a time in California, I think a lot of people were affected by cult, a lot of that generation. Oh, yeah. So, it was kind of a cult explosion back then, wasn't it? And, you know, all the, the acid concept of taking people on inner journeys, was popular and you know i'm a kid so i don't know anything about that literally but in the 70s we went to this thing in our own near our own neighborhood we were like in the girls town you know and mm -hmm. my mom was postal worker pretty blue collar stuff and uh single mom and then we go to a church service next so we're invited to a church service and it's a revival style but it's purple and gold every and you do feel like a revival thing, you know, like the preaching get going and energy gets going. And then we're preaching like, listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I can never forget you. I can never forsake you. Something like that. Mm. And like, and we still remember it. And you get the chill. So it sounds you like, yeah. 
I was going to say it's it's we've already identified two markers of cults, haven't we? Sort of like deceptive tactics. Love actually three. Love bombing. That was another one, and then the whole mystical manipulation, milieu control, sweeping you up in an exper- an ecstatic experience, and you think this is God or the divine or or whatever consciousness. So we're already starting to pick up on a few cult sort of markers, aren't we? I love this for the way you're narrating. Because <laughs> I'm just trying to piece it together in my mind. Looking yeah. back at right, figuring out what happened, you know, uh-huh. and the more answer the better. And yet, everything you just said. Also, my mother was swept up in a feminine movement because all the leaders that Donato, who was the leader, co-founder with Sri Donato, and I have other aliases for them, but just going with those names don't confuse your listener because they had all these other names. Yeah, so they founded it as a couple, and but he put all the gopis out front, which is the female clergy, dressed in white, beautiful, tiaras on their head. It was a presentation. And the women inspired my mom, not to speak for my mom, but she said in other interviews, you know, she was impressed that there was female lead. It okay. attracted, look what they've done with their life. Right. Maybe this is something I can work for. Right, it's a feminine empowerment. That was the message anyway. Unlike Christianity, it's mm-hmm. a major factor. It was like one of the draws of religion of New Age at that time. Mm-hmm. Major, major. So we get these readings, you know, in the groups, and, and it makes you feel tingly, and like, oh, they know the future. And that's what's being sold, is we know the future, and we can help you with your past lives through these readings. And so my mom was very entranced with it. And we continued to live in North Long Beach for some time. And the next thing that happened after Donato, well, before Donato's the male leader, at age 10, we were initiated as disciples. And that's the first time we got a name change. Oh yeah, the- another classic cult tactic, isn't it? Change your name, change your identity. Yeah, fully. Mm-hmm. You, know, you drop all worldly connections. You're with us now. You're in the spirit. Mm-hmm. And this is your manifest name. You're signing your book in the book above at the same time. So you've been given a new identity in that sense, because that's another part of it, isn't it? There's the sort of laying aside of your former self, and now you're taking on the religious persona. You've got a new name. you got a new identity. You're, you're part of the group now. So I definitely... I'm going to say yes to that. Mm-hmm. You're part of the group. You're given a silver medallion, which had their own logo that they had created with flames around it and a lot of talk of fire and initiation, and you're in a new world. Mm-hmm. You can astral travel with us. You're going to know things you never knew before, mm-hmm. find open alternate stuff. So that's age 10. Now, we're still living in North Long Beach where we first interacted with the invite. And then by 11, we come a block within the temple we move which is what they called it the temple mm-hmm. so seventh and molino is to east long beach and that's a change in school district it's a change in neighborhood we've broken now i know like the trafficking element for me is huge is like i've broken connection with all the friends i had from age five to eleven that's a lot of friends mm-hmm. and we were in the junior high we lived a block from it and was like being um, the most popular kids in school. It was amazing. <laughs> and um, it was over. <laughs> Soon yeah. we moved. The reason is the master requested after her husband died that everyone who dedicated moved within a block of the temple yeah. or like, within a mile. But again, that's another classic cult thing, isn't it? Where you're you're unmoored from your all the normal things that are surrounding you, your friends, your family, your neighborhood. So now they're uprooting you as well. They were up, they totally did it. And my mom changed locations. And so it was okay for her as far as like not interrupting her income. But it was also showing like we're totally entrenched at this like mm-hmm. age of, you know, we're also, both of us are musicians and we go to school programs and stuff. And the school was much further. It was really hard. I mean, you know, and then kids were making fun of us because there's no connection. So you're the new kid now. Uh-huh. So we just stepped together as twins do. And we went through it like that. And then we became next major change. I got to say, you know, there's classes, there's readings. You're studying the arts that they're presenting, astrology, numerology, 
aura reading, all this stuff. So that's what we're doing and helping them have sales and garage sales and events. There's like no personal time. It's gone. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Yeah. So they're working you like long hours. Was that part of it as well? Yes. Which is another classic marker. I, I hate to keep saying that, but it's true, isn't it? Yeah. If they work you too hard, you're you're physically tired, you're emotionally exhausted, you can't think critically, your mind doesn't operate the way it should. So that's another mechanism of control, isn't it? And she took everything, every inch my mother gave was leaps and bounds. This leader took advantage mm -hmm. of these two young people, you know? Yeah. And when I look back, she's working lots of people at once. Yeah. So um, it's nasty, but but it was pretty to look at. And we have all the beautiful altars, and we're reading the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible. Um, mm -hmm. We were told that Long Beach is directly on the globe across from Jerusalem and very special. Ooh, holy place. See? Sacred space. That's another one, isn't it? He was in the mix. That's what religions love to do. They create a sacred space and then they say, you know, you're, you have to do whatever it is to gain entrance to that sacred space. So it becomes a prized commodity that they control again. And for your listeners, the leader, uh, female leader, Tree Donato is now deceased in 2003, but she's buried under the building because of oh, the sacred. Of course she is. <laughs> it's just that holy. Did that make it holier when she was buried underneath there or what? You're an old dad. Oh, of course. Wow. Right. I was like, wow, how'd they get the permits? This is one of the things <laughs> that affected me when I heard that because, you know, like she would uh, terrorize us in our dreams far after we left. Right. And so it stopped at one point and I realized it was after she died. Wow. You know. And such was the level of control she had over you. Yeah, so by age 12, she advanced us into a duet for the church. My sister and I played music for the mm -hmm. original music that we wrote. So she took my sister's already existing musical skill, who was a natural songwriter, and I sang. And exploited all of that. We wrote original music for the church, played original music, and we were initiated again. You're going to love that, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that wasn't enough. Bring you not. further in. Yeah, bringing you further in. Yeah. So we were called the Daughters of Ice. Ooh. Because Atlantis is a part, you know, the new Atlantis is okay. a part of Cyrus and Isis. is so much part of New Age. And their Egyptian connection, reincarnation, the Bermuda Triangle. Wow. Now we look back and it's like, God, this is... Yep ludicrous but at the time it's it's everything isn't it everything if you believe it all and you know this yeah you, you can't just, think critically at that age no no you're memorizing everything you're told right so mm -hmm. i was during school i would be learning to do the hieroglyphics type art that they created for the astrology symbols they recreated the graph of each planet and star so uranus pluto mars venus I, it's been a while, so I'm right. Mm -hmm. You know, also looking at ephemerises was a daily thing, which is the location of the stars at any point in time within 12 hours. So you can get a chart mm -hmm. on any event. So they would do charts on any event, like the birth of Christ or whatever time. You can get date, time. And people who do astrology and you're listening know what I'm talking about. But I did forget to say one thing, Clint, because you're making these markers. The first time I ever heard, and in the when I first did this um, in an interview with another podcast that hasn't aired yet, it really choked me up because, like you say, it helps us to remember what went on. Oh, we yeah. had a reading with a gopi called Morning Star, who was one of the original founding gopi. And you can hear more about her story under Lee O on my podcast. Long story there, Morning Ramble. But gopi Morning Star gave us a reading, sat us down with our parent present, so my mom was there and my sister and I and told us, we don't read charts like everyone else. You're twins, but you're exactly off. Mm -hmm. Bullshit, you know? And and she started the wedge. She started the wedge, which has never been repaired uh, really? between my sister and I. Yeah. So, so you're still not in a relationship now after that? No. Oh, that's oh, no. sad. Oh, yeah. She broke so your family apart, really. Good percent. 
Yeah. That was the goal, too, because you got to get the most out of each person. After she could exploit the twin thing, she went on to, you know, exploit each of us individually and pick our parents. Mm -hmm. But it breaks my heart to now see the roots of the programming, you know? Yeah, where it all came from. Wow. So that was the astrology, like our first astrology read, telling us we're exactly opposite. We have different paths. It was, thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks, because we really do now. Yeah, literally. It's a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy. Well, I was going to ask you, stepping back for a minute from your story, what was the sort of theology? What was the, the belief system of this group? Because you mentioned a lot of things. There's New Age in there, astrology. There's Atlantis. There's all these geographical locations as well. What was their basic belief system, if you could kind of boil it down? Yeah, so if Buddha, Gandhi, Jesus is how I would really sum it up. Right. And all the New Age stuff from the Book of Urantia and I am philosophy. And then, she, you know, so we've got to clear the planet. We have to open ourselves as vessels. We are the 144,000 chosen one. Mm -hmm. You know, each church has that, right? <laughs> and then um, and then we're going to, when Donato died, he ascended to the spaceship above alone. And he's there now and she channeled him. And right. the basic said just to develop, to abandon your ego, develop and be in your higher self all the time. And then when the California coast falls away, which is constant apocalypticism thrust upon us. So it was very evangelical and apocalyptic continuous. Let's say it's a strange right. mix of, of at least three religions and a bunch of new age stuff thrown right. in for good measure. And readings of your sub and subconscious and past lives could be random anytime you're in a group session or class that you thought you were going to learn your neurology in. The master can bust in and freaking little you. Tear you down. Tear you down. So the clearing sessions, quote mark, um, mm -hmm. was kind of, I think, is a Scientology knockoff without the equipment. going to say, yeah, clearing the planet. That's the goal of Scientology. Yeah. She might not have used the exact words because she learned how not to plagiarize because she was even contacted by I am and right. told not to. <laughs> yeah. So, but then it would be true readings, astrology readings. Everyone should become a reader or a healer. So there mm -hmm. was also cleaning and adjusting your chakras and, you know, reading your past lives. So you would come into the Sunday service, which was very elaborate, right? She was a Catholic. So, I think she based a lot of ceremonies upon Catholicism, mm -hmm. even sacred bread later and stuff. So, um, but you would sit in this chair if you want to get healing and she would, you know, place the hands over the area, raising them up and opening your, your seventh chakra. So it's a lot of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christian together with the spaceships. Right. And Throw the spaceships in there too. She was proud to say we're the cult of the cult. And <laughs> and, um, Other cults are jealous of us, huh? This was clearly before Jim Jones had happened in 79. Yeah, and then, I say. Mm -hmm. And time-wise, then, what, 89 for uh, the Nike crew? Um, oh, yeah, Heaven's Gate, 93, I think it was, somewhere around there, 92, 93. So she was saying this stuff before that, all the deaths took place. And then afterward, she would, um, in classes, joke around and give people Kool-Aid and just smirk. Wow. Literally drinking the Kool-Aid without the cyanide in it. Loyal to check the loyalty. No. Yeah. And so it was pretty strange stuff. Once you get in that boat, stuff started to happen. But in the main Sunday services, people would come and it would be like a traditional service. And then you would get healing and feel nice and hear music, have basic finger food or whatever. And so, yeah, I mean, there was quite a lot of showing is the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very performance driven. Yes. Yeah. Big time. And then earning money, you know, we're all in this together. And you might hear some words of wisdom from the master during the event. And you mm -hmm. feel blessed. Because during when you worked eight hours in the sun selling crap in their parking lot behind, and... you're doing God's work. Well, absolutely. The master. And you're not you're... getting paid for it, I'm sure. It was all free volunteer labor, wasn't 
who made yeah. it your belongings to be sold. That sounds, yeah. again, another classic cult thing, isn't it? Not only are you raising money for the cult, which flows upward to the leader, you're working so many hours that you're physically tired, emotionally. Again, again it, you're not be, you're not able to think critically and all those things. So it's a kind of a double whammy, isn't it? Oh, God. I mean, and she was willing to work anyone to death because there was clearly financial hold one time after I became more in training, quote mark. And by the way, it's a sex call. So when you're in training, you're going to be pretty close to getting involved in a sex call once you get told you're in training. <laughs> um, right. And how old were you at this point? Okay, so so basically when we were the Daughters of Isis, we were 12. And then that continued into, you know, you're in this secret training you can't talk about with your parent. You can't talk about with anyone. 14. So that started at 14. We had three groups. Daughter of Zubaisis, the Kamasi Order. She made up all these weird names for their order. Mm -hmm. I -fi -e. And then the two Gopis that were left. And those six people, we were like involved with training. Quote. Now I look back and it's like, oh, that's a sex ring. That was a sex ring. Right. I had to interact with each of those people sexually at some point. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. So, so you're being sexually abused at this point? So at 14, the heavy petting and publicly touching and stuff, grooming began. And we would be said, you know, to dress a certain way, to act a certain way and carry yourself a certain way. Your hook is for Jesus. That's what they and, said? Because that yeah. sounds like. The children of God, David Burke, the flirty fishing, same kind of thing, wasn't it? But we didn't have to, I don't remember sessions where I was told to interact with the public in a sexual manner, but I, I would definitely be on stage and being docked at as, you know, people have redhead finish and um, I've learned way too much about this. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, she exploited that. Yeah. And She's it's like exploiting your sexuality as well. Yes, 100% before we ever got a chance to find out what it was our, mm -hmm. ourselves. You know, you're, you're way too young. Way. The movies, the inappropriate films I write about my in this unpublished book I have that, you know, movies like Harold and Mott, where a young man loves an older woman over 60, and the society can't see it, so they take their lives together. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's appropriate for a 14-year-old? Yeah, it's a bit over the top, isn't it? <laughs> Fatalism and, you know, the suicide programming began. Suicide programming, if it doesn't work out, just take your life. It's like, well, I think that's what they want people to do if they leave. And, you know, who knows? Who knows? But mm -hmm. it's tough to realize the programming um, as you become awake later in life. And the sinister manner. A lot of this was psychology techniques that she used. I now know. And Clint, I don't know. I'm jumping around a bit. But I just did an episode on this that was quite oh, unnerving for me. I didn't realize that I had been trained to draw these mandalas to basically silent me. In a time yeah. I would be at. Yeah. And it's called automatic drawing or automatic writing. They would teach this type of concept and technique. And, but I didn't realize that it was being done to me, NLP, neuro linguistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep, yep. later, after the abuse had been going on and on, I lost my mom and my sister. I, I was doing this in the live sessions where I kind of became mute and deathly dead inside. And I was drawing these mandalas, and she would walk on. I left with the journal. This is after she started to teach me about Carl Young. And how he used in his psychology of himself and others, he used young mandalas as the people draw them to try to read their subconscious. Mm -hmm. that she was doing this to lead me. It's a, a designed a circular or a square with a center point that's symmetrical on all sides. And, and this programming clearly to lead me to center around her as my master, not around me, myself, mm -hmm. you know. It was a type of limit. And I'll be damned if not until I wrote my book, my own timeline for myself, knowing, not knowing yet if I would be able to publish it or whatever, but I wrote it out. 
And I discovered that this, I stopped trying mandalas the moment I started writing. It was like I took my end. You switched it off. Yeah. So sinister, right? Yeah, I was going to say it's another form of control because it kind of reminds me of another cult uh, tactic of the loaded language. It's similar, I think, in that way, isn't it? That it's a way to shut your critical thinking down, a way to close you down. You don't have to think. You can just draw mandalas or babble, whatever the, the loaded language is. It's a way to stop that critical thinking. And I know you know this through Christianity, you know, like scriptures that are recorded and stuff. There's mm-hmm. like words and hypnosis going on there too um you know and i realized like the symbolism of mandalas would take me to this fucking excuse me veg place mentally Mm -hmm. and it disarmed me it disarmed me it quieted me i would draw to check my mood later in life until like until 2022 and then i realized like there's words and there's pictures in this programming so it's not that I'm scared of everything. It's just that it's like, wow, okay, let's recognize the feelings and the thoughts that go with certain words and pictures. Oh, yeah. Or that's part of the reconstruction, yeah. isn't it? When we come back from the break in the second half of this conversation with Frankie Tees, we're going to be getting into this issue of rebuilding, reconstructing your life. And I also want to find out how did Frankie get out of this cult? How did she escape in the end? And then what has she done to put her life back together? It's an absolutely fascinating story as we come back with Frankie. I just wanted to mention what's coming up here on the next few episodes of Mind Shift Podcast. I just got back from a really good holiday with my sister Valerie. It was great to see her again. Haven't seen her in four years. We went to Ireland. We went to Northern Ireland, went to the Giants Causeway and a lot of other places. Really cool trip. So we're a little bit behind on these episodes, but I'm going to be catching up soon. We've got a conversation with Charles Utter. He wrote a book recently called Roman Collar Crime about a priest in the town he grew up in. Absolutely just an amazing story. So coming up with Charles Utter. And then I've got, going back to sort of the Doug Wilson stuff, I had a conversation with Emily Page. She's a survivor of the Logos School out of Moscow, Idaho, a victim of serial sexual abuse there. She's got an amazing story of not just survival, but again, like Frankie, rebuilding her life on the back end of these horrific experiences. And then I had a chat the other day with Jared Stacy. He's a PhD student. He's actually American, but he's studying at the University of Aberdeen way up in Scotland. And he did a lot of writing on Christians, conspiracy theories, how it all relates to what's going on with QAnon, with Trump's big lie. And he's got a really fascinating perspective. This is actually his doctoral program that he's working on now. So we had a really good conversation. So kind of diving back into some of the Christian nationalism and conspiracy theory stuff that I did a while ago. Great conversation with Jared. And then, of course, if you watch the Shiny Happy People documentary, I finally finished that. My sister Valerie actually put it on her iPad. She downloaded it on Amazon because I don't have Prime. And so I was able to watch it on the plane flying back and forth to Ireland and some of the stops that we made. That was a fascinating story. So I'm going to be doing some more stuff, I think, on Bill Gothard and what I consider to be a cult, the IBLP, the Institute and Basic Life Principles, which, of course, I was raised in along with my sister, Valerie. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to do a podcast. I wish we had done a catch up, but we will do something at some point in the future, I'm sure, talking about our experiences growing up Gothard. And what I'm doing lately is I'm trying to put more and more stuff out just exclusively on Patreon. So a lot of that stuff, I think, will be on Patreon. I tend to put up an episode every other week in between the normal podcast like this one that drop for the general public. So if you want to be a supporter of the show, you can do that. The links, as always, are in the show notes. In fact, I wanted to give a thank you to Barbara. She's our latest Patreon supporter. I just got word that my T-shirt that I sent out, it was really a nice little gift for Marianne Franklin. That came the other day to her. So if you support the show at a $10 a month level, I'll send you a really cool Mindship Podcast T-shirt. And if you support the show at a $5 a month level, I will send you a nice little gift, something you can only get here in North Wales where I live. So let's get on back into the second half of the chat with Frankie Tees. I want to find out her story. How did she rebuild her life? How did she get out of the cult? What is she doing now? So let's finish this episode talking about programming, lies and manipulation, surviving the Morning Land New Age cult. (music) 
we're unpicking the conditioning, un unpeeling the layers of the onion. The more you go down that road, the more stuff you discover. My God, I was being controlled here. I was being manipulated there. I was being undermined in every way. And of course, it's going to screw up your identity, your, your own psychology, your self-image. You got to rebuild all that. And with you, I mean, the fact that you retook drumming is amazing. Like, you're, <laughs> you're like I'm not. I never stopped. <laughs> I just quit playing for the church. That's just sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rock and roll therapy. Forever. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I am thankful that we're in a weird way, but it's one of those things I think where, yeah, looking back on it, I could say, well, I learned to play the drums at 16, 17, 18, around that age to be a rocker for Jesus and to play in worship bands and all the rest of it. But uh, all that's gone, but I've still got the actual skill. Like you said, I can still play the drums. It doesn't matter if I'm now rocking for, you know, secular music or whatever. I still, I have that skill. So it's one of the things I can, you know, pull out of the rubble, I guess you could say. Oh, yeah. Good analogy because mm -hmm. like, as old kids, you know, like this is the concrete around us. Oh, yeah. You do the break up the rubble to get out. Like, mm -hmm. if you get out, if you get out, a lot of people get stuck. In it's true. A lot of people get stuck. So did you end up getting out? Obviously, you're not in it anymore. How did you get out or did things get actually yeah. worse? There is a good ending. Yeah. Oh, sure. good. Like, um, it did get worse. Um, what happened is sequentially at age 14, we then started having the grooming. And even these two commissary male order men that were like, it sounded funny the way I said that, male order men, but uh, mm. an, a sac sacred order that the master had created called the commissary. So they would pick us up from school. They started getting all like, this is your scheduling. And uh, yeah, and my mom was at work. So she just knew we went to the temple after school. She didn't know all the threat. Oh, yeah. And and then she was disarmed by being told by Saravati, Gopi Saravati, the number one left hand person to Sri Tanana, our number one groomer, who really recruited us into the music department. <laughs> Wink. So she would tell my mom, you know, you cannot interfere with what the master is doing with the training of your daughter. And my mom was like, I am now in trouble. Like my daughters are listening to them more than me. She just took the reins and she really had a fight started looking into how she could kidnap her and so forth. So this is that age 15 or 14 that she has by, um, she continues to work her same day job. And then they start dropping us out of school at age 16. The master just said, you just come here now. You don't have to go to school. So once you're during summer or whatever, there's no vigilance by the school, which we went to Poly Technic in Long Beach. There was no vigilance to check up on where did they go to be transferred to another school. We just disappeared. We freaking disappeared mm -hmm. right in the middle of town right then. It's hard to look back on because there goes my education. Boom. So it just gone. Whole girl, time with, you know, with these witches. And one man is left, Thomas X5, who's now the Lama. And Gopi Shokru and Gopi Saravani and Sri Janato. They're my whole world, 24 spent. And, you know, we make appearances and still sleep in our mother's house, but we do not answer to her by age 16. By age 18, they kicked my mother out in a mass excusal of disciples who she doesn't want anymore. So the ex communicated your mom? 18. When you were 18. It was like, waited for that ding, midnight, you know, uh -huh. like every pedophile. Am I right? And uh, absolutely. I have a stand up comedy routine in me about this. I know because I can really get down on the pedophile aspect of mm -hmm. So disgusting. They think so long term. So they kick my mom out. And then um, we're there 24 7. They, she just told us pack her bag and be there later that night. And then she kicked my mom out. There was no discussion, nothing. It was like, we got them. And of course, our loyalty and our programming was fully to dedicated to the master. So, you know, there was a brief goodbye on my part to my mom. And then she 
lived right behind the temple in the parking lot. All she could do was take pictures from her window. It was pretty bad. I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. Full shunning, full excommunication of her obtaining us as she had always planned. And then mm-hmm. it was a strange time after that. We went through sleep deprivation, total enslavement, sexual assignment to multiple partners, all women. I experienced drugging, being brought to a smelling salt. I don't know what happened during that time. I'm sure it was sexual. And this was mainly at the lodge. They have in Crestline, California. In Crestline, they go and do special things they can't do at the lodge, <laughs> the property in Long Beach. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean. no, under a prying eye over there, you got a lot of privacy in the cabin, two, three story cabin. And so I don't know if they still have that. I would love to know. Um, but that's where stuff happened a lot. So by the age of 22, you know, I'm full numb. I had tried to run away like three times, ran out of money. The financial deprivation really adds to, I think you can attest to this, mm-hmm. um, really adds to the limit of choice. You know, like the one time I somehow had a stipend or something, I don't even remember how I got money. And I just stayed in a hotel for two nights just for the utter quiet, just laying there. I'm like, what am I going to do? And then I just crawled back again. You know, this is how it goes. And so you have to be willing to leave with nothing. You've heard this before. You've done it. You know, but it's so true. And I literally one day was just like, I'm walking out. I'm walking out now. I'm just walking out in plain day. No hiding, no sneaking. Mm -hmm. And one woman who was not even involved in all, you know, came and said goodbye and gave me a hug and said good luck. And the master came and looked me in the face. Who's going to watch the children who were just babies? Uh huh. Turned away and I was. That's what you got after using and ringing me out all this time. Bye. And I had a dollar. I found a dollar in my sister's address and I, and I took a bus. There was still a, a bus for a dollar back then. Yeah, you could get pretty far on a dollar. <laughs> and, and we didn't have cell phones, you know, Clint. Oh, yeah. So, so we're old. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I go to Dana Point. And this guy stops me. He was driving like a white rape van, you know. Oh, no. The story turns out okay, but it's so strange that I would even answer him. But he was mm-hmm. like, hey. And he called my sister's name because we look alike. And uh, I-, I turned. I was like, I'm not her, but I am her twin. Like, do you know where she works? Yeah, I do. I was like, oh, my God. He thought. He goes, but she doesn't work till such and such day, like tomorrow or the next day. You could stay over in my van. I've got some cup of noodles. I was like, okay. I had nothing. Literally no nothing. Cup. Yeah. So that's how it ended. So glamorous, right? And then... That then means it, you got out. I was going to say, that's the good, yeah. the good news, isn't it? That you finally got to the point where you fled the place with a dollar in your pocket. Yeah. Something breaks, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the doubt. is just like the cracks are showing and I've got to, I've got to do can't i can't lose one more inch of myself my mind my soul and you know there's that little cave inside of me where you hid all those times that it's like i'm still here and i'm still me you didn't get me and i'm not her so there's that 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 thing that keeps you going that spark of life you know but that's your authentic identity i think that's you've, you've suppressed it and had it suppressed for so many years but it's still in there that little flame is still flickering isn't it like, you know, because mm-hmm. you're preaching on the other side now, trying to <laughs> warning them about extremism is like an amazing gift. What you yeah. Doing. So, yeah, but we've been there. You and I, we've been on the on the dark side. Have we? Of course, we thought it was all part of the light back in those days, didn't we? But now you see it so differently. And talk about mind shifts. Like, I love the name of your podcast because it takes quite a bit of, you, you know, like just the thing you just said while you feel the utter darkness you're being told this is for god this is for light this is for the 144,000. we're saving the planet it's like the exact opposite it's programming it's lies it's manipulation reality challenging newspeak whatever orwell 
you know, mm-hmm. just loaded language. The opposite. Yep, you it's feel a... so horrible. And you're like, sure. this is all for the good. Oh, yeah, this is great. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's again, another classic. It's not just cults. It's religion, isn't it? Whereby they tell us that you can be part of something bigger than yourself. We're clearing the planet. We're saving the world. Whatever your mission is, you're part of that. So all your personal sacrifices are worth it in the long run, even if you're literally killing yourself and being subjected to all kinds of horrific abuses and so forth. It's all for the greater good. And it does feel like you're dying inside, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. But you're just, um, you're going against yourself so often, you just abandon you. And so, yeah, so the ne- first thing I did was I started learning how to dance and I started teaching ballroom dance and got into music in a different manner than I had been in a church. So that was cool because I love music. Really, music has really been the number one means of recovery for me mm-hmm. from coming out of morning. Yeah, but I can attest I- to that. It's really important. Like I couldn't, as I tried to narrate a little bit in my story, the psychology was used and we would even do attack therapy in a group one time in front of 200 people. I was stood up and called a whore because I was wearing tight clothes to a job she allowed me to have when I was 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. And it's like a whore. You're whoring me around all of your clergy. What are you talking about? I should have said. And instead, I stood there and cried as everyone around stared at me and, you know, how they use the group against you. And those sessions would be so terrible. And that's later what Synanon did. That's what I was trying to think of. Mm-hmm. And they, what uh, Dr. Walsh helped me learn about it, uh, attack there. It, it was called the game. And you go into this huge room and everyone says whatever they want. As long as you don't hit the person. Which you can imagine was pretty vicious. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, that, yeah that's what Morning Land was like at times when she wanted to take you down a notch because you gained an inch of confidence in any man. But that's another classic cult thing. I mean, I hate to keep saying this, but the, it's hitting so many markers, isn't it? I've heard so many stories about people being dragged up front of the group and being stripped down, told all their sins or all their shortcomings or whatever it is. And they have they have to like be enduring this horrible. Basically, it's, it's like a group abuse, isn't it? I had a friend when I was the pastor of a church. She she'd gotten out of a very controlling cult like church, a Bible cult, basically in the Portland, Oregon area. And that's what they used to do. They used to put them up in front, and everyone would go around the circle and talk about all their sins. So music is your major kind of therapy, I guess you could say. Did you end up getting actual therapy as well as getting into music and dancing? No, um, I would go to a few, like when I was in community college, I went to the free therapy that was offered. Obviously, money is a factor. But then again, it would replicate my training, quote mark, with the master. Time to sit down and do a forced confession. It, it was horrific. It was so triggering. Like, I was going to say, yeah. Sounds massively triggering. So similar. Like it was almost exactly the same. You know, they would write in their book while you talk. It's like, no, I can't. <laughs> so I would read a lot, I read a lot of psychology. Divorcing myself from these rituals, like the fire and water ritual, which is the sort of prayer, new age prayer. You know, just divorcing myself from these things that were programmed in one at a time as I discovered them. Um, getting into music and dance, getting into travel. I wanted to know everything about the world because I hadn't learned. I hadn't been taught. Mm-hmm. I had been taught huge version of it like yeah, so stuff. sheltered so sheltered like you know we don't have media and magazines and books as other people do we are told what to read the bhagavad gita carlos castaneda the bible the upanishad these were the books i read over and over and over or mm-hmm. so she blessed like carl young psychology yeah but again it's it's information control isn't it that's yeah. part of the bite model isn't it behavior control information control so you're you're being told what what you can and cannot read, what you're not exposed to. They're controlling what's coming into your mind, and then ultimately controlling you because that's the information you have to work. As Lalish said, you know, mm, um, you're limited to what you're exposed to. The bounded choice, right? Exactly. You think you have the freedom, but you really don't. When you look at it back now on on it later, you actually uh-huh. don't. You didn't have any choice other than to get out, which is what you finally did. It sounds like in the end, you did too. I mean, it's like 
you what choice are you left with when you realize oh my god things just start falling around you the tracks begin to show as that weird song says i think it, the artist is mm-hmm. but it's like cracks just the the light is just like shining through in little digits like oh my gosh there's a whole world out here okay well i'm going to europe <laughs> i went all over the place i met a guy and he was studying in europe and i went to austria and germany and we went to ireland and a bunch of places on the train czechoslovakia and it was so mind-opening like i learned to draw i learned me- the arts were very human draw something other than mandalas by the way and uh i was drawing people and scenes and, and landscape getting into nature has also been very evil you know mm-hmm. i love so much love the ocean so much love nature and i was i mean when i look back we were entrenched in this compound which is still there at seven de molino and we were 10 uh blocks from the beach never once did we go to the beach my friend never once it's like this is so sinister and now I, like as an adult i've just been gouging myself on the beach I mm-hmm. love so you weren't allowed to even go to the beach even though it was like a few minute walk away no we not so it's keep you that control the pressed tired overworked state is all so one of the things i loved about the larry ray documentary called stolen you it shows the moment you have any time, you just start thinking, what am I doing? This guy had a five minute break. He went up to the root of where this cult was. And and he, Daniel Lev, Levin, I think is his name. And he goes up to the roof and he, he, he thinks about jumping first. And then he's like, wait a minute. I can just leave here. I could go back to the, to the dorm where I live. I can just leave here. And he does. And that's how he gets out at that moment, mm-hmm. right? That yeah, the moment. moment of clarity. It is all it takes. And that's what we're obviously, you and I are hoping to reach people that are still there or that are recovering and realize, like, get out. You know, the first thing you got to do is to get away from this active negative situation. Uh, yeah, it's for you your like best you. mental health and your own well being. If you want to survive this life in any sane state, yeah, yeah. It is for your mental health. Get the hell out. And uh, it's been a journey. You can imagine. I, I even tried to take my sexuality back by becoming a stripper. I mean, it, it was like desperate. Like, think about if your very identity of you has been tampered with, you have to reconstruct. Well, you know, that's what the reconstruction is. Mm-hmm. You know, we all approach it in different ways. And for me, they had, you know, told me what to dress, who to be with. To be with the opposite sex, which was not my thing, the same sex, which was not my thing. I'm naturally straight. That's my own, mm-hmm. you know. That your orientation? My orientation is straight. I like guys. And yet, and yet, because I had already kissed boys by 11. I'm just saying, I was already exploring. I found it out. And yet, I was made to be with these women for like six years straight. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a mind. Yeah. It really is, yeah. Yeah, I, I, and so I just remember, <laughs> I know that's the strange stuff, you know, for some people to hear because I guess they think survivors are cookie cutter churchgoers. It's like, I remember the, the moment I was, ha, ah, I just got endorsed by the opposite sex. It feels good. Mm-hmm. I was staying. In a strip club on stage, buried in one, like, and five, up above my ankles, the whole stage. And I did a set to ACDC <laughs> and uh, Hell's Bells and all of that. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, it, it was like we all had a really cool moment. I did a lot of upside down tricks and boom. Ah, okay. I can feel good about myself right now. Sounds strange, but I took it back. And that's really a struggle for each of us. We got to figure out, like, you know, society, you want to judge me? Screw you. Where were you when I needed you? I don't even care and stop, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? Because that'll get that back. Yeah, for sure. The school, my friends, my family, other extended family, they never came to rescue me. So Mm -hmm. there is a chip on my shoulder. 
Yeah. Something well, to change. I was going to ask you, speaking of, okay, you're talking about recovering your sort of authentic identity and all that. Did you find yeah. that since you're, I guess, classed as a first generation cultist, you didn't have, you weren't raised in it like me. So you, right. you had, you had a pre-cult identity. Did you find that after you left the cult, you escaped basically, did you have to go mm-hmm. back and sort of reconnect and reconstruct with that person? Because I think you said you were about eight years old when your mom got involved right. with it. What was that journey like? Well, first, our relationship was destroyed. And even though I tried to interact with my mom and my sister after they reconnected in Long Beach, it was uncomfortable. I didn't understand that relationship had been destroyed with my twin. So is an extra mind F because if you have that identity with your twin and everyone just knows you as a twin, everywhere you go, the twin. And then she just went cried that apart. The master, Sri Donato destroyed that so now i literally had to start over more than some i mean age eight isn't much of an identity even though so it was all tied up so i renamed myself i found myself renaming myself twice after i left that that habit stuck and um and by the 30s i thought i had really settled on my true self with frankie t sounds crazy but Mm -hmm. it's a long story how I came up with that but basically I do feel like this is the identity and if I change it again I'm blind to myself you know this is I know psychologists will tear this apart you have alternate personalities it's like no I don't like to think of it like that I mean this is all parts of yourself that helped you survive you know and then when you're renamed by a cult you can get, maybe get out of it by renaming yourself out of that and it helps so when I settled on Frankie and realized, like, I'm not embarrassed to my sexuality and I want to help other people feel the same. We are who we are and that's who we want to be and let yourself be free. And so that that's a part of the healing process for me and being public and being accepted by people as my authentic self. That, that has been great. And it's also like a double edged sword because if you're public, your cult can bother you. And they have. You know, in in little way, they definitely do all that stuff online too. So there's a silence mm-hmm. factor, and you have to be prepared uh, to take it. And I'm cool with it because it's clear to me that they want to be able to do this to more people, and that is the activism you others and myself are doing. Is if we don't make this known, it will be generational further. And so if, if we're in 40 years after the fact. And I'm speaking out, and they still have the same exact set. Mm. Mm. I was going to ask you about that. Is the cult still going then, even now today? Correct. Nothing's changed except that this is the succession. And I was there when she trained these people. So three of the people that were involved in my sex ring abuse are leading the place now, and they have other new members under them. This has not changed. It's still a sex cult. It's still destructive. It's a grift. It's a a whole city complex from one corporate to the next on 7th. They have a large property. And so why? Because churches get a pass on every, you know, they're not held to the same standard as a liquor store around the corner has more standards than these churches. It's true. Yeah, the government rarely wants to get involved, don't they, in religious matters. So, yeah. How many people are in this cult? That's my question, too. How many people would you say are in it now? So it went from like in its heyday in the 70s from like one to two thousand. And now it's probably 100 from the rumors. I They're hanging on. Not growing. Yeah, they're just hanging on by a thread. And it scares me that at any point they can hit a nerve and and blow up or Mm. spread the wealth around, you know, teach more because they have another goat being out. So they're they're continuing Mm. the order. Yeah. And the worst part for me is that these people like me are going to die out before we get the real story of all that took place because of the vow of silence. Mm-hmm. I know there are other young people that were abused in Morningland, and I really want to hear their story. And at some point, that'll be the piece de resistance for me because I need you. If you're listening, come on, man. You got to do this with me. I need to. I need help. Um, right, right in this thing alone, are we, Frankie? I hope not. <laughs> That's it. I felt, 
I found a lot of you folks who are from other religions, but I need people. It's hard to actively speak against a current church. Yeah, it really is. We we need it. Yeah, I sure. appeal. I appeal to you, people who are listening, who are young in Morningland. The damage is done, and also, you know, Clint, I know you're very well aware of this with your details that you've been spreading on Nash, Christian National. It's very similar. The whole New Age concept. It's like we have the way, the light, and the truth. Everyone move away. We're gonna, you know, this dominion idea of being so oppressed is how they're still there. So they've sold the idea, they've gotten away with it, and religions don't get inspected. Even um, mm-hmm. the article, which was quite a victory after 20 years, the first expose article came out and it was in the true crime category in their newspaper called Signal Tribune. I think it was in April. It, it in fact, was because the Grand Prix was going on and I was saying to myself, excellent exposure they'll pick up that paper Mm -hmm. um the fact that they're still there and and somehow being enabled the city even wouldn't answer questions on whether people live on premise which i expose that they do and we did and the reporter even went to the police who said well we would have to you know we don't know no comment type of thing and morningland had no comment it's like this is what it's going to take is more news articles child by press because all the statute of limitations, and this is where the system is grub. The statute of limitations stop us from really getting any justice for ourselves. So we can get justice for the next generation so that it doesn't continue happening. But we do have to go outside the system a little bit to do this because there is such, like you mentioned, a hands-off approach to religion they don't pay taxes, so there's not a lot of exposure on what's going on with their finance. It's a great place for tax, and it's all under the big gold pyramid like it is in Morning Land. Uh, <laughs> and yours was a cross. Symbology changes, but it's like the same thing. We're going to get as much work and money out of each of you until the next one comes along. Um, the next victim comes along. Well, and looking back on what we were talking about, you know, it was interesting as I was talking about the various cult markers as you were going through it, you know, these things are universal. Like you were saying that you had a gold dome or whatever, and I had a cross over my church, but the tactics, the psychology, the way it affected so many of us, we might be from different religions, different groups and so forth, but we have this journey that now we have to embark on, don't we, to rebuild and reconstruct our authentic identity. Yes. And the more people saying it, the more others who are kind of still hypnotized by this nonsense will come out of it. Because it's not just more jargon that'll do it. It's authentic voices saying, hey, I'm awake. You know, I look back and this is what happened. It was all a lie. Wake up and, Bad. you know, enjoy your life now. Enjoy That's right. Life now. Become your authentic self. That's true. Well, just one last question, though, before I let you go. How can people find you on social media? What's the best place to get a hold of you? Best place is, and you can choose where you want to, is frankiegoutspodcast.com, as there's a lot of change going on with social media. But I am on Twitter at Frankie T. It's F-R-A-N-K-I-E-T-E-A-S-E. That's mm-hmm. public. And also on shows like these, <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, FrankieFoulsPodcast.com is a good one spot to check out where you can subscribe and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, can find you there. And you can hear Dr. Clint episode on my podcast there too. That's true. Yes. I'm glad we were finally able to return the favor, have you back on now, Mindship yeah. Podcast. So thank you so much, Frankie. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I've learned a lot about this new age cult that I'd never really heard of before. And yes, it is. It's interesting to speak with someone like yourself who's so versed in the Bible, and you mm-hmm. could see how they drew from it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're pulling stuff from everywhere. Certainly the three three major religions with a little bit of comets and UFOs and New Age and you know, astronomy, astrology, Atlantis. They've got it all in there. Yeah, and I think it continues with cults like Love Has Won, Profundity Yours, mm-hmm. Leon Ashanti. And people should, especially in your country, in the UK, Leon Ashanti has just come under investigation for this financial abuse. It's incredible. And you know, online is just a maelstrom of 
tuning on the one on one. You can get free reading and then that's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, they're, they're very adept at using social media and the internet now to recruit. That's a new thing, isn't it? That we yeah. didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago. You had to nope. talk to somebody face to face, one on one to pull them in. But now you can watch mm -hmm. YouTube videos and get find yourself getting sucked into a cult that might be located in South Africa or Korea or Britain or anywhere. Absolutely. Mm. So we're here fighting fire with fire. That's right. You've got to keep getting the word out. So thank you so much, Frankie. Mm -hmm. Take care. And I'm sure we'll speak to you again sometime in the future. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.